Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot episode 289 featuring the second and final installment of my interview with Mr. Paul Newrath of Other Side Entertainment. Now in this interview we talk about Paul's resume, basically the games that brought him to fame, including of course uh, Lutzema Underworld, we talk about the System Shock games, Thief, Terra Nova, and much much more. I know you guys are going to like this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Paul Newrath. Mm-hmm. You know, I was doing my book, uh, Honoring the Code. I tried to come up with old nicknames for the different, you know, designers I talked to. And I think if I was going to add you, you know, maybe to the second edition, I'd call you the, the risk taker. You know, because it seems like all throughout your, you know, your history, you're always really sort of out there on the cutting edge doing stuff that, I mean, it was fascinating to me that even, uh, you think if anybody would, would have gotten uh, Ultima Underworld and just immediately saw the potential, it would have been uh, Richard Garriott. Uh, Lord British, but you know, you're saying even he, you know, you had to really make a case that you know, try to convince him that this that this this would work right and uh, be a fun game. Yeah, well, you know, I think anyone looking back then, uh, before we had a demo of the game, we we had a demo. It only took us less than six months to have a playable prototype of the original Underworld. Uh, and once we had that demo, we showed the demo to to Richard and and. Uh, Robert Gary and his brother and some of the other folks there, they got, you know, they got the potential. But before then, it was just hard to explain. You know, when you said, hey, we're going to do this, you know, 3D texture map or immersive world, no one had done such a thing. And so it's hard to visualize that. And I, I think that, um, you know, that this is the nature of the beast. And, um, uh, you know, once we had the demo, it showed the potential. Um and the rest is history. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me to think about how revolutionary that game was, you know, especially at the time. You know, this is well before Doom, uh, Wolfenstein 3D, uh, anything like that. Uh, you know, look, in retrospect, you'd think that any publisher would have been really into this and, and wanted to jump on it right away. Uh, it's kind of funny to think there was so much skepticism uh, about it. But we got down by most of the publishers. Yeah. I mean, basically, we you know we pitched it around to you know EA and you know the major publishers of that era, and they said, no, we're not really interested in this. This is we don't we don't we don't get this. Uh, but that's I mean, it's not necessarily even a technological innovation. You hear that a lot about in any you know books and films. I think when anyone's trying to kind of break of the genre, um, uh, you know. Uh, okay. A TV series like Breaking Bad, amazing that ever got that as a as a project. I mean, who would think that a, a, a TV series, a slow paced TV series about a high school physics teacher, you know, becoming a drug dealer, is even the basis of something successful? So, you know, I, I think it's just the way entertainment is, and the folks that are the established publishers of entertainment. Uh, tend to go heavily on what they know and what's been proven. So they look at what sold last year and say, you know, that was our big hit last year. Let's do more of that. Um, and that's not even necessarily a bad decision because I think that often is commercial success. Uh, but on the margins of that, it, if there's not innovation, genuine innovation in the games industry or any creative industry, it stagnates. You know, you can't just do more of last year. Uh, so I like to think, you know, uh, yeah, I, I am a risk taker creatively. I enjoy kind of disrupting the status quo and proving that something, you know, that doesn't seem like it would make sense can actually work. Uh, but it, you know, commercially it's, it is risky, uh, you know, looking glass had its ups and downs <laughs> and, uh, that was in part because we do these games that were really pushing the envelope, you know, system shock being a prime example, system shock. System Shock 2 were commercial failures. Um, and it wasn't until years later that they really got the recognition. Um, we were just too far ahead of the curve on those games. And uh, so, you know, 
just because you're taking credit risk doesn't mean it's going to be rewarded <laughs> commercially. I was wondering to what extent. I've seen theories that one of the reasons they weren't more successful was just they put so much. You had to have a really nice PC, you know, at a time when there weren't, you know, hardware acceleration and, and all this kind of thing. Do you think that's might have played into it? People just didn't have the uh, the right setups to really play it. Right. I think it was part of it. I mean, the, the games didn't play that well without a high-end PC. The frame rate was pretty bad. Um, I think probably a bigger factor, and we learned from it, uh, System Shock, uh, you know, was, was arguably one of our most innovative games and really pushing on all fronts. We put so much into that game. There are so many aspects to it. It's a very deep game. Uh, but it was also uh, very demanding on players. The user interface was, uh, for its time, uh, way out there, very complicated, and, and you had to manage a lot of a lot of little elements to figure out uh, how to play that game. Uh, it, you know, accessibility was uh, so unless you were, uh, it was the kind of game that you had to push through initially to figure out how to play it, um, and. That's asking a lot of players of a new game they don't know they're going to like or not. So I think that accessibility, we learned the lesson on Thief as an example, where we dialed that way back and, you know, really prioritized making it accessible and simplifying um, and, and pushing the, the subtlety and the nuance of the gameplay deeper into the game itself, not up front in your face in terms of the interface. Um, and... To no surprise, I suppose, Thief was by far the most successful game that we did commercially. It almost sounds like the Nolan Bushnell story about, you know, computer space to Pong. <laughs> you know, simpler works. I guess simpler sells better sometimes than more complicated game. If today, you know, the game has been re-released, System Shock 2 has been re-released uh, about a year and a half ago, and it's actually sold quite well. Um, so, you know, players are more sophisticated now. They've played a lot of first-person games. They know the conventions. Uh, so part of it's just timing. You know, we, we were too early with that. The, the, if you want to be commercially successful, you, you can't be early and you can't be too late. So there's a timing. Yeah, I love looking at the various games that you've worked on and some, you know, I can see in each case some really innovative ideas and I think they'd be very fun, very promising. Uh, but for whatever reason, they just wouldn't, it's kind of hard to say even for me now to look back and say, well, what happened there? Like with the Terra Nova, I think that was what, 1996, uh, the tactical first person shooter, squad oriented tactics. You know, it sounds like it had everything there to be a great game. Well, Terra Nova, um, and, I, and I think it was a, a great game. I mean, it wasn't. It had some flaws in it. It was, didn't come out quite the way we wanted it to. Terra Nova was one of the more challenging products we had, you know, games we had under development. It was uh, three and a half years in development, uh, which was a very long time. And uh, the the engine we were built, we built our own engine. And by the time it was close to the way of development, it was clear the engine was already getting pretty outdated. And we had a difficult decision because we could either go back and re, you know, revise the engine, which would push it out at least another half year and make it a four plus year development cycle, or just sort of live with the engine we had. And we made the decision to live with the engine that we had. One consequence is when the game went out, came out, it wasn't visually, it was visually a little bit behind the curve. Um, and that didn't help the sales. The other thing is that Mech Warrior 2 came out, I think a couple of months before us. And MechWarrior 2 had, you know, lots of marketing and lots of support. And, you know, that uh, that didn't help us commercially. Yeah, it always stinks when something like that, the timing is off on something. Uh, I was, uh, I, you know, I had Robert Surotek on last year. And we talked a little bit about you, uh, talked a little <laughs> bit about you with him. And he was going on about, and I think he's really proud that he, he says he published your first ever product, the... Uh, Deep Space Operation Copernicus. <laughs> he did. Yeah, uh, did ever, Sir, Sir, that's uh, probably a distant memory oh. now, but uh, do you look back with fond memories on that 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 experience? Yeah, well, I like the the, the Surtech brothers. Uh, you know, Surtech and, and Robert Woodhouse and those guys. I mean, I was a huge fan of Wizardry, which is one of their classic 
game series. Um, oh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed Wizardry, and it helped inform, you know, it was one of the games that inspired us to do Underworld. Um, so, you know, it was a classic game of the 80s. But I, I enjoyed working with Surtech. They were a fun group, and uh, they gave me, you know, creative space to do my first game as an unpublished author. So that was that was pretty, pretty cool. How, how old were you at that time? Uh, I was about five years old, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I had graduated college a couple years earlier, so I was probably 25, 24, 25, something like that. I saw that you also had done some work on Ultimas 3 and 4 and Auto Duel. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on, you know, what those contributions were. Um, I did some design work when I started, and I think it was Ultima 4 and 5, uh, but uh, I, uh, uh, I was a fan of the underwear of the Ultimas as well. And I saw that, uh, on the back of the box, I think I had finished playing Ultima three and I saw from the back of the box that they were, uh, about 40 minutes away, uh, in New Hampshire for me. So on a lark, I just drove up there and introduced myself to, uh, Richard and the other guys. Um, and they were quite friendly and welcoming. So, uh, we just started, you know, talking, and uh, it wasn't long before they said, hey, well, um, you know, we'll, we'll give you an office. I was never an employee, but they just said, you know, come work out of our offices. And so we just sort of had an informal relationship. I was working on my own game, which they ended up publishing, which is the, the second game that I worked on on my own, which was uh, uh, Space Rogue. Uh, but uh, I did a lot of just sort of helping out, and we did kibitzing on design work, so... When Auto Duel was under development, uh, you know, spent a bunch of time with uh, Chuck Boucher, Chuckles, who's the developer behind that, and uh, worked on Ogre, did some, uh, some of the eyes for Ogre, uh, which was Steve Jackson's board game, uh, conversion over to the to the Apple. On um, you know the Ultimacy was working, on, and I learned a lot. I mean, I it was a, it was great for me because. You know, I've been working mostly on my own before then. And, you know, both the camaraderie, but just learning from these different developers. Uh, Chris Roberts, you know, showed up in that time period. I got to work a little bit with Chris. And uh, there are just some really talented guys who all shared a passion for, uh, you know, making these games. Um, and when Origin decided to move, uh, relocate back to Texas in uh, the late 80s, um, that was really the impetus for me to think about starting my own studio. And that, you know, 1990 started uh, Blue Sky. But if, if they had stayed around, I probably would have just joined them and become part of, uh, you know, Origin. So. Oh, well, what might have been. Aren't you glad you got that Apple II, though? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you still have that Apple II? You know, I don't. I, I kicked myself. I should have kept it. I know Richard still has his Apple original apple but uh no i sold that years ago well i wanted to talk a little bit more about space rogue uh it's a very interesting looking game and i noticed that it was i've seen it described as sort of a combination of elite with uh i guess ultima so you get sort of an rpg and a space um it had and, you know elite had those wireframe graphics but this one had solid polygons right so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about this game and also how it inspired uh, Chris Roberts to go on and do Wing Commanders and Privateers. Um, well, the game came out, it was really for me the first game where I, want, I, I thought about doing a hybrid gameplay that wasn't, you know, one genre or another, but was trying to blend two genres. So uh, I was trying to blend uh, 3D space combat uh, as an action game, as a real-time 3D action game. It didn't use texture mapping, but it used solid 3D models uh, for the spacecraft and the planets and the moons. It had real gravity. It had, uh, you know, orbits and gravity. And the space mechanics to move, so it was sort of a really realistic 3D space sim. Uh, so that's some similarities to Elite. But then, you know, you were a character in the world. You had a role, uh, a little bit like an, uh, an Ultima. Uh, and uh, you could land on a planet or land on a space station um, and interact with other NPCs and get missions. 
And it was the first game I did where I really wanted the player to make choices. So you could be basically three different roles. It, it wasn't a traditional role-playing game, but you got to decide uh, uh, about a third of the way through the game. You could basically decide whether you wanted to be a space pirate and, you know, try to, uh, uh, you know, take on uh, merchants and steal their cargo and sell it for profit. Or you want to be a merchant and just shuttle stuff back and forth and make profit that way. Or whether you wanted to be uh, kind of an enforcer and, you know, take on pirates. And you could play any of those three roles. And then depending on which you, you could do, the world would react to that. So it had a very simple scheme of it knew if you started to take, you know, become a space pirate, you'd get a reputation and the, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, powers that be would start gunning for you and, you know, putting a bounty on your head. Uh, but the other pirates would like you and, you know, welcome you in. Uh, so it had that, you know, it was a very early experiment for me of, of letting players choose a role and then seeing how that role impacted the world and how the world reacted to you in that role. Um, and again, this hybrid between 3D space combat and, and some role-playing elements. Um, you know, I was learning a lot on the game. It's not a perfect game by any means. It was also the last game I did where I did everything. I did the programming, the art, the music, uh, pretty much made that game. I mean, Warren did a little bit of writing. That's where I first got to know, really work with Warren. Uh, he, he did some writing on it and, uh, uh, and I, you know, worked with some of the other guys, but, uh, pretty much, you know, 95% of that game I, I did myself. Um, uh, and I realized through that experience that that wasn't the best way to do a game because I'm not a very good artist by any stretch of the imagination. I was a pretty good programmer, but, uh, you know, the art, uh, I wasn't good at at all. And uh, so it convinced me that I needed to work with a team on the, on the next project. But when that game was uh, wrapping up, I remember Chris uh, Roberts uh, uh, played the game in intensively for a period of some weeks and asked me lots of questions about how the 3D worked and what I was thinking about design. And a couple of months later, he did his pitch for Wing Commander. So, yeah, I think it, we helped inspire him. I mean, Wing Commander is, is quite different in some important ways. So it's, it's, and, you know, it's, but I think he played that game and he played Elite, you know, he was a big fan of Elite and some of the other games. So it was one of the games that I think got him thinking about Wing Commander. And I, and I think probably where uh, Space Rogue influenced him most was in creating a, a, a real 3D action, you know, space combat game where you're battling people in real time. Uh, I think he saw that that could really work well. And of course, we started doing texture mapping and then he started doing texture mapping with Wing Commander and, and creating that kind of realism. So I think that influenced him as well. Do you have anything to do with the choice of cover on Space Rogue? I was admiring that guy in the, the leather jacket there. That's pretty cool. Uh, um, I actually, the, the story there is that, uh, that the marketing guy for Origin at the time, he was, he was great, uh, great guy. Uh, but he, he had a, a thought at the time of doing photorealistic covers, taking, you know, uh, uh, photo shoots using real actors. And I didn't realize he was going in this direction. And the one that he asked for my input, and I said, the one thing I want is not a photorealistic cover. I want something that's a piece of art or is an abstraction. I don't want photorealistic. That I'd prefer not to. And we ended up with a photorealistic cover. So there you go. Marketing. Ah, uh, marketing. Yeah, I was really, I listened to another interview you did. I think it was with some guys from MIT, if I looked at that right. So, and they were talking, you talked in there about how you actually worked on one of the Madden games for uh, the Sega Genesis. And apparently that, I don't know if this is still true, uh, but you said that was probably the most, you know, the biggest selling game you'd ever worked on. <laughs> this is, you know, Madden um, game. Yeah, for that for that era it was. Um, with the, the two... The first two games that we did as Blue Sky were Madden Football 1993 for the Sega Genesis and Ultima Underworld. Two very, very different games, <laughs> as you might imagine. Completely different platforms, completely different genres. Uh, kind of crazy that we do those two games, but our thinking at the time was that Underworld was a risky, kind of wild, we didn't even know if it would be a successful experiment. 
And so the thought as a, as a small business was, let's do one game where we're, it's, it's, it's a slam dunk in terms of we know it's going to be successful. Madden 92 was, was a big success. It was with Electronic Arts. They were, they were paying us well to do the development. Um, and we had some, as developers, we had some background on the Sega Genesis. So it's a platform that we happen to know. And EA was in a, in a pickle because the original team doing it, at my understanding, had fallen apart. And they were five months from having to ship Madden because Madden needs to go out on by the first day of the football season. And they came to us and he said, you have five, five months to do this game. I'm not sure they thought we could even pull it off, but we did. It ended up selling over, uh, you know, well over a million units. I think it did like 26 million in revenue in the first six months. It was, I believe, EA's biggest selling title up through that date, biggest revenue generating title. It was a monster hit uh, and grew the Madden franchise. So it 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 was sort of a struggle for us to do a, you know, a football game. People think of Looking Glass. Uh, at least I'm looking to us, but it uh, it generated some nice royalties for us and helped fund us getting uh, Underworld done. So no, no problem with that. Did you guys have a lot of football experience? Uh, zero. <laughs> 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 but you know, as a game wow. designer, I've never I've never wielded a sword and been in a fantasy environment either. That didn't slow us down. You know, as a game designer, you take on all kinds of topics, and you know, I. I learned football and, you know, uh, and, and again, we weren't doing an original title. We were doing a sequel of Madden 92, the formula. Had, I, mean, I, I think we generally improved on it. And, and uh, but, you know, we, we were taking what they had on, on Madden 92 and improving on it and being very selective about, you know, the improvements. We only had five months. So it was not a huge, uh, uh, huge change from the prior game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, game design is, is, you, you learn as a game designer to really embrace whatever the subject matter you're doing. I mean, if you're passionate about it and uh, I enjoy working on that project, it, even though I'm, you know, I don't follow football per se. And you guys, of course we've talked about flight unlimited already, but the, I mean, that was a huge, huge game is my understanding. Right. And then uh, also um, a bunch of yeah, golf that was, games. That was quite successful for us. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a blockbuster, but it did quite well. Um, and that came more from, my, my uh, you know, the, the, the co-founder of Looking Glass, uh, after Blue Sky had been going for about a year and a half, well, two years, we merged with Learner Research, Ned Learner's group, to form Looking Glass. And uh, Ned had done uh, Chuck Yeager's flight trainer uh, at Electronic Arts in the 80s. You may have a copy of it. Well, I got Chuck but, Yeager's Air Combat. Uh, he, he, were, he didn't do, I don't think Ned worked on that one. So he did the flight trainer one that was done in 86 and then a follow-up like an advanced flight trainer, I think in 88 or 89. Uh, so he gained a reputation as being a, a top guy and doing flight simulations. And uh, so, you know, Ned, Ned, when he joined, he, he really wanted to take that forward with Flight Unlimited. And we did. I mean, Flight Unlimited was uh, pretty revolutionary in its time uh, for doing the aerobatics and the photorealistic training. Um, you know, but one of the things that I've talked about this before is I think if we were to do Looking Glass over again, we'd have a much tighter focus on genre. You know, having having a studio, we were, you know, always a small independent studio uh, and doing sports games, role-playing games, uh, you know, flight simulations. And in our last couple of years, we did Nintendo 64 games. You know, it was it was all over the map at times and you know it's hard to manage all that it's hard to keep uh, a tight vision on what you're doing when you're tackling so many different genres uh so you know i think we we we, we our ambitions were too broad in terms of tackling all those different genres yeah i saw you, you use the word hubris <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to describe all this and it sounds like the team was there was I guess they were working on such different projects that somehow that resulted in some tension in the within the the group, right? Well, it did, and so doing those different genres uh, contributed to some of that tension. We had people who really loved the flight simulation, and so they they came to Looking Glass to do flight simulation, and that's what they were passionate about. And then we had also folks doing you know the role playing, first person role playing. Uh, in immersive games like System Shock and Thief, and that's what they were passionate about. 
uh, you know, the people when we were really pushing on Flood Unlimited to get that, you know, wrapped up the last six months, a lot of developers, you know, we kind of put additional resources on it. And some of the people were, you know, somewhat resentful of that. And they felt like we shouldn't be putting the effort on that game because who really cares about flight sims? Those aren't real games. Um, so it could create some tension. And that's one of the challenges of trying to run a studio where you're trying to do these very different genres. And it would have been easier for us, no question, just to say, hey, we're going to be known for a particular kind of genre. You know, you look at Valve and they're known for a particular kind of genre. It's just easier to manage it that way. I think you've complimented uh, Blizzard for that as well. Or... And Blizzard. Yeah, Blizzard is known for certain kinds of games. And, you know, much larger studio than us even back then. And, and uh, you know, they kept to their knitting in terms of genre. And I think, you know, we, we had some hubris. We felt like we could tackle these different genres uh, effectively. And in many ways we did, but it came at a cost. So you got no plans to do a flight sim anytime soon? No, no plans. <laughs> All right, just a couple of last questions here, Paul. These are some some, some that have been submitted by uh, some of my Twitter followers. Uh, this one's from Evil Soft. He says, "Why didn't you ever release editing tools or source for the Ultima Underworlds?" You know, People weren't doing that back then. That really wasn't something that, that people were doing in the early 90s. And so I don't even really think we thought about releasing those tools. The tools were pretty, uh, not the easiest to use. They, they weren't documented or anything. So people, you know, the, the designers had to come up to speed on using them. So I, you know, I, I don't think we, we thought about those tools as something that you would hand out to the audience. Also, this was, you know, probably something the DA would have said no way to. I'm guessing back then that really wasn't done. It wasn't until the mid nineties that people started to, or the late nineties, later nineties that people started to release, you know, editing tools and people were starting to do mods and that kind of thing. So, uh, and then by the time that happened, I think we had just, that was an old product and we weren't thinking about releasing tools for it. Plus EA owned all the, you know, control all the uh, publishing rights. And again, I think that would have been a bit of a hurdle. All right. This is, Probably too big of a question to be asking at this point, so <laughs> I'll just throw it out there anyway. But this is from Jack Day. He says, what do you think of the current state of the games industry? <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe um, we can focus a little bit on just, you know, what impact do you think the Kickstarter and the crowdfunding has had? Well, I think it's, I think it's I'll just answer it this way. I think it's great that, the, that there's a thriving indie development community. You know, there. If, if you went back ten years ago, you might have drawn a conclusion that the days of indie developers were were doomed, and that it was all you know going to be publicly, you know, public, large funded companies that could you know put a lot of money behind a title, and then that was the only way forward. So, sort of the rebirth of of indie developers who could be creative and try new genres out and new gameplay and be successful at it. Uh, is is awesome that, that 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 door has opened up, and I think that helps keep the industry, you know, interesting. It, it keeps it fresh and, and and you know gives me reason to continue to work in it. So. Well, thanks again, Paul. It's been really really nice chatting with you. It's nice chatting with you as well. Yeah, now so you've got to get going. Uh, I have just one last thing. I was wondering if you okay. do you have any plans for you know what you're going to do after Ascendant. We're really keeping a tight focus on just doing Ascendant now. So, again, a bit of a lesson from, from uh, the looking last days, not to get too ambitious. So, you know, we have our hands full with uh, Underworld Ascendant. So we're going to really focus on that. And uh, we'll want to do more games beyond Ascendant, you can be sure. But uh, we're just not thinking about that at the moment. So. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a, a new retrospective. I haven't quite decided what to tackle next, so uh, let me know what your suggestions are, and I will consider those. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys, for your continued support of my show. Matt Chat really means a lot to me, guys. You have no idea how happy it makes me to know that you guys actually care about... Uh, the work I'm doing here. 
And along those lines, I have created a new trailer for the channel. This is the new Matt Chat trailer. Uh, so check that out. It's about three minutes long. Let me know what you think, and uh, uh, hopefully we can use this to help grow the channel a little more. So if you like what, uh, like what you see there, if you like the show, please uh, take a minute uh, to share that trailer, uh, send it to some friends, post it on Facebook, Twitter, uh, your favorite forums, whatever, guys. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. It'll help out more than you may realize. So thank you for that, too. All right, I think that's good for that. So how about that news? From the Matt Cave. Excellent! All right, guys, got a lot of cool news here. Uh, one is a, a, a gift from Joe and Hannah. You remember them from Well Not Studios? Probably some of my favorite guests. Uh, ever on the show. Really, really great team. And they have sent me a uh, the journal they were talking about in there. And they sent me a card, or I guess a sheet of paper, really, uh, with a nice uh, wax seal on it. And it says, Merry Adventures in Rodent in the Matlands. So apparently they have taken my advice to rename the game A Serpent in the Staglands to Rodent in the Matlands. So very happy uh, they have taken my advice. And then, of course, we've got this journal. Now, I don't I haven't read this journal because I don't know if it might spoil some of the game. I was going to wait and see uh, you know, how it's going to work, but I, I have looked through it. Lots of really cool maps and pictures. I don't know if you can see this or not, uh, but it's really awesome. I think this will really add a lot to the experience. Uh, plus, it just feels really cool. I can almost kind of just want to wear this thing. <laughs> this thing. And I mean, it even smells good. It's got that just really nice leather aroma to it. I almost kind of want to chew on this. <laughs> it's just really cool. Uh, I haven't really seen anything like this. Uh, so I got to hand it to him. That's a pretty cool uh, item there. Okay, in other news, uh, some of the old rare guys, remember those uh, Donkey Kong Country, the Banjo-Kazooie guys, uh, they have uh, released a Kickstarter and it just went up, I don't know, maybe yesterday or the day before. They were asking for 175 a uh, thousand uh, euros or pounds, I think it's pounds, I'm not sure, it wasn't U.S. currency. Uh, but anyway, they reached uh, 1.1 million already, uh, which is just phenomenal. You know, I would expect these guys probably have enough uh, uh, recognition from the Donkey Kong Country and Banjo-Kazooie. Maybe, you know, I wouldn't be surprised these guys hit four or five million, maybe even set some, uh, set some records. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Anyway, the game they're making is called Ukulele. It's kind of spelled funny. Uh, Yuka Lele, and it's a 3D platformer, so you know it's kind of in their strong suit. So go check that out. Should be a really awesome game. Uh, also, in other news, I remember last time I was talking about Steam and these paid mods, and uh, apparently they have already decided to cancel this program. They just had too much negative publicity from that. Uh, so uh, that is what it is. And then finally, uh, I have uh, my friend Casper back today to help me with Matt Chat. He looks uh, really ready to play some games. Uh, I don't know if he's still playing. I don't know if he's finished Pillars of Eternity yet. I, he hasn't really been back <laughs> to finish, so he's probably ready for me to pass out uh, so he can play. All right, so what about that Ale of the Week? Uh, well, this week I've got a little number called the Dirty Bastard. This is a Scotch-style ale, one of my favorite styles, from the Founders Brewing Company. And these guys are out of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I don't know how, if you'll be able to find this locally. Hopefully you will. I made it all the way from Michigan, but <laughs> you know, I really don't understand the system by which these beers are distributed. So Anyway, this has got 8.5% alcohol by volume, so... I would say this that puts that uh, pretty high on the scale, actually. You think uh, Budweiser, most macro brews, somewhere 4 or 5, uh, maybe 5.4%, 5 somewhere like that. So it's well above that. Uh, it's not crazy strong, but it's definitely one you wouldn't want to uh, swig a six-pack of these and try to drive somewhere. Uh, definitely not. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's, that's uh, looking for any other information here. Uh, not really seeing anything. Do not litter. <laughs> that's that's nice. You know, I would have thrown this bottle on the ground, but this tiny print here, do not litter. I've changed my mind. I will not throw it on the ground after all. 
Uh, government warning, pregnancy, 50 IBUs. So anyway, that's about all I can learn about this. So sorry, not, not very informative. Uh, but let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this dirty bastard here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, I wonder why bastards are so dirty anyway. I, I could take a bath just like anyone else. Anyway, this uh, smells pretty good. I'm a little bit congested, though, I'll be honest, so I'm not really smelling a lot uh, of an aroma coming off of this, but I don't <laughs> definitely don't smell anything bad. Just kind of a, a little bit of hops, a little bit of a... Maybe a little bit of a cherry aroma on that, but uh, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, sorry. But anyway, let's give it a taste. Definitely tasting those uh, uh, that scotch-like quality. Uh, sometimes I think they actually bring in some scotch barrels to uh, rest the beer in, kind of get some of the flavor from those uh, uh, those barrels. I don't know if they did that did that here, uh, but it definitely has a nice uh, scotch-like uh, flavor to it. Uh, very, uh, I'd say a little bit towards the bitter side. Definitely tasting those cherry uh, flavors, a little bit of a smoky, uh, just a little bit of a smoky-like uh, flavor to it. I'll give it another taste here. Yeah, really nice and sweet. Uh, you sort of get the bitter and the sweet, sort of uh, doing a little dance uh, together there. Uh, not nearly as uh, foul, as I would assume, giving a name like Dirty Bastard. It's actually quite smooth, quite drinkable. Um, definitely a little bit on the, uh, you know, the alcoholic side, so you want to be careful with that. But uh, I'm really liking the taste of this. You know, if you like a, a good strong uh, ale with a sort of bitter and sweet uh, combination, I think this would be a really good choice. Uh, dirty bastard, you know, I might have to go a full, uh, it's been a while since I've done this, but I'm, I'm going to have to go a full 5 out of 5 drinking Excellent. ones. So just really enjoying the, the flavors here. Uh, dirty bastard, you know, I don't really see how you can go wrong with this one, plus it's kind of fun just to say dirty bastard. So, you know, even if it was a 4, I think I would knock it up to 5 just because I like to say dirty bastard. I think I could just do that for about 10 minutes, but <laughs> anyway, know you guys have better things to do. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotations about taking risks, because uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, Paul's thing. I come across this one from a movie called Thelma and Louise. I have to admit, I haven't seen the movie. You know, I heard it. I guess it's a classic, whatever. Just haven't, haven't seen it for whatever reason. Uh, so let me know if it's uh, worth seeing in your opinion. But anyway, the quotation is really awesome. And it goes something like this. You get what you settle for. See you guys next week. So, Crates, the only true wisdom consists in knowing that you know nothing. That's us, dude. Oh, yeah.